today we're going to be talking about parallel programming in Julia. Uh, so we started teaching, uh, well, actually, Marie started teaching uh, Julia programming about a year ago. So it's one of the newish languages in the HPC world. Uh, so along with Chapel, uh, Julia also has quite a lot of parallel stuff built in. Uh, so this is our first look at parallel uh, programming in Julia. We will explore other topics uh, in this area in the future, in, in future webinars. Uh, so today's uh, primary topic is to look at the unique features that Julia brings to parallel programming. So basically, how does Julia does parallel programming and does it do, uh, does it, do it differently compared to other languages? So the short answer is yes. There are lots of uh, very interesting uh, developments. And everything I'm going to talk about today, you, know, you can run on both multi-core PC and on distributed uh, memory uh, HPC clusters. So today we're going to take a look at uh, the threads, uh, a distributed uh, uh, library for launching processes. Uh, I will very briefly talk about cluster managers, but we won't uh, go into this topic very deeply because uh, well, there's actually not much to talk about. And uh, we'll also talk about arrays, how to work with parallel arrays in Julia. So using distributed arrays and shared arrays. Uh, there are a few topics that we will leave out. So we're actually we're hoping to talk about DAGA in this presentation, but uh, we only starting to look at it. So we were not very successful in paralyzing codes. And then there are lots of other thing, things that, you know, like there's a, a implementation of MPI message passing interface for Julia. And uh, that is not unique to Julia, so we'll not talk about it. And there are various implementations or more advanced implementations of threads in Julia. And we'll also leave these topics for uh, a future webinar. So multi-threading in Julia uh, is built right into Julia and it's been around for uh, quite a few years there. And uh, uh, the way you use uh, multi-threading in Julia is uh, you want to use, so it's, it's packed into the standard library, so base threads. And you don't have to import it. So you can actually start uh, using threads uh, right from the main uh, namespace of Julia. But you probably want to uh, say using base threads because uh, in this case, you don't have to prepend all threads, functions, and macros with uh, threads dot. So let me start Julia here in a terminal. Uh, this starts a Julia shell, a, a repel. And uh, I'll be just copying and pasting commands uh, for now from uh, my slides. All right, so here, if I just say n threads, it will complain uh, how many threads I'm running. It will say that, well, uh, this function is not defined. So what I need to do is I will simply uh, copy this line. I will import the threads library, and then I can say n threads, and it says one. So I'm running uh, uh, Julia just using a single thread. So I'm going to restart Julia. I will actually restart it with a flag minus T4. And uh, this, is, uh, this works starting from Julia 1.5. So prior to 1.5, all the versions of Julia actually had to pass an environment variable. But in, in either case, this will start uh, Julia uh, and will uh, let you use up to four threads. And now if I run n threads, you'll actually see, oops, I need to import the library, of course. You'll see that uh, now I'm running uh, Julia using four threads. So um, you can, uh, the basic way of parallelizing uh, using multiple threads in Julia is to use the add threads macro. So right here, we have a loop for i, i goes from one to 10, and then at each loop iteration, we're simply printing the iteration uh, number on a thread ID. So thread ID is a function that returns a number, in this case, we'll return a number from one to four, showing us which thread is running uh, the, current, uh, the current print line. So let me just take and uh, paste this into the terminal. And I run this and you see that it ran, actually, I, I probably want to uh, raise this a little bit. Uh, it ran on four uh, threads. Uh, so you have iteration nine on thread four, iteration 10 on thread four, then thread two, thread one, and, and so on. So you see that uh, the order of these is actually random, which indicates that uh, these ran uh, really in parallel, not in serial. So uh, parallelization is, is very simple with four loops using threads in, in, in Julia. So here's an example uh, where I initialize an array. And then I, so it's an array of zeros. And then I simply fill this array with, uh, with uh, a thread ID for each, uh, for each uh, array element. Uh, the value is going to be the ID of the thread uh, that is writing to that element, right? So let me just copy this. So A of I is the ID of the thread that is writing to this element. And then if I print A, you will see that I get the distribution. So there are ten. Uh, there are there are ten elements, and there are four threads. So each thread does either two 
or three uh, loop iterations. So it makes sense. All right. Now, threads are well suited for shared memory data parallelism uh, without any reduction. So unfortunately, the threads implementation in Julia does not have any reduction. So what is a reduction? Well, if you do computational multiple threads and then you wanna take the result of a computation on each thread and compute something based on that. For example, you're computing partial sums and you wanna compute the total sum. Julia actually does not have a mechanism. Well, Julia threads does not have a mechanism for doing that style of reduction, uh, uh, reduction, unfortunately. So you can still, I will show you many examples of how you can actually do this, but unfortunately this is not automatic with threads. So however, threads in Julia are really perfect for uh, doing shared memory data parallelism. So let's say if you have a data structure uh, that, is, uh, that is large, and then you are processing the data structure, let's say you're filling an array in parallel from multiple threads, uh, then you actually see a perfect speed up. So here's an example where we have, uh, where we have um, n set to a billion, and then we have an array of uh, billion elements. Uh, so zeros, all, uh, all zeros. And uh, yeah, I'm clearly running Zoom now, so it's much slower for me than usual. And then uh, here I simply fill in the elements and I actually won't run this because this takes, uh, so I'm running, so here, if I were to paste this, uh, this will run in the global scope. So not inside the function and this will actually be very slow. So, but if you were to run this, you will see that if I run this in serial, just filling all the elements, uh, elements computing the uh, uh, log uh, base 10 uh, of I for each element, then it will actually take a couple of minutes. And then if I parallelize, take exactly the same code and I parallelize it, it will take uh, roughly four times uh, faster. So in this case, we are doing data parallelism. We're just filling a, uh, each element of the array and the entire array is divided into blocks. And then each thread is processing each block. So threads are not communicating to each other. They're just talking to, well, they're just filling the array uh, values in shared memory, right? So everything is really easy and you get pretty much perfect speed up. Now, if you wanna add reduction, so let's say you wanna compute uh, in this case, a sum of all integers from one to a million. Uh, then you uh, are breaking your loop, your summation into pieces and then into blocks. And then each block is processed by uh, an individual thread. And then you're taking all the special sums and then you are adding them to a total sum. So a naive implementation would be to do something like this. So here you have total uh, is equal to zero. So this is done on the, main, uh, on the main thread. And then you're launching four threads. And in each thread, we are adding I to the same global variable, right? So we have uh, the loop, uh, the, uh, we have a uh, uh, loop for i one to a million, and then we parallelize it with threads. So parallelization is automatic, it'll just work in, uh, 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 with threads in Julia, and then we're computing total. So the problem with this code is that it's not uh, thread safe because all uh, threads are updating the same variable. Uh, they can actually override a value without uh, letting, uh, without waiting for the other thread to finish, right? So threads are competing uh, writing into the same variable. And uh, sometimes, well, actually in many cases, uh, a thread will write into a variable without uh, waiting for the other thread to finish. So this is a problem. And in fact, if you take this code and you run it multiple times, you will see that every time you run this code, you will get a different result. So every time uh, oops, I run this code, oops, I get a different result. So you see this number is different from this number and so on. So this pr program, uh, is not, is not good, it's not thread safe and it, uh, it's not deterministic. So every time you run it, you get a different result. So it's very easy to uh, make this uh, thread safe. So one way to do this would be to use an atomic variable. So here, instead of just saying uh, total is a regular integer variable, we're saying that total is an atomic variable of type integer 64, it's set to zero. And an atomic variable is a variable to which all threads can run, can write, sorry, all threads can write, but they have to wait for other threads to finish writing. So if one thread started writing to a variable, it locks that variable, and then no other thread can write into this variable until uh, the first thread finishes, and then the variable is released, and then other threads can start writing. But the end result of this code, so the code works, and it produces right results. So we can actually paste, and we'll see the familiar sum of all integers from zero to, uh, to a million. So this number is gonna be exactly the same every time you run this code. The problem with this code is that it's gonna be, it's gonna be uh, slow uh, because uh, the atomic variable by design, uh, all, all threads, so in this case, I'm running on four threads, one thread is writing to the variable, all, uh, the other three threads will be waiting for the first thread to finish writing. 
and then there is a, a lot of waiting involved. So these, uh, this um, calculation is going to be a lot slower than what we want to do ideally. So uh, since we started talking about uh, speed in Julia, let's uh, do some benchmarking. And um, uh, both of us, so Marie and I, when we were preparing this webinar, we actually uh, were quite new to Julia. And we had to learn a lot. So there are lots of things that I want to point out that are very important when you do benchmarking in Julia. So here is an example of a code on the left where we have, uh, it's the same code, so we have summation. Uh, and um, we are, so we're summing numbers from one to a billion. And then we're computing the total sum. And we are, actually, it's a serial code, so there are no, there's no threading. So every time you run this code uh, on a single processor, it will give you exactly the same result. And you see, uh, when you run it and I time it on my laptop, I get the numbers roughly 90 seconds every time I run it. So I run it three times and, and every time I get the same, the same number. All right, so the problem with this code is that uh, when you time it with the add, uh, add time macro, uh, it also includes the compilation time. So the just in time compilation time is also included this, uh, in, in, into these numbers. So it's marginal, it's probably much slower than 90 seconds but it is still included into this time. So there's also another problem is that there's no optimization here. So um, every time you run this loop, so whether you're doing this inside the repel, inside the Julia shell, or you just take this code and paste it into a script and run the script, um, uh, there is no uh, pre-compilation. So every time you, uh, you run this code, uh, Julia has to process lines one by one, and then there is no optimization that is Always that always happens in Julia when you when you compile functions. So consider the same code and let's just wrap into a function. So now we have a function that is called quick of n. So n is the argument, and then we uh, we uh, so we write this function, and then uh, you want to run it once in order to pre-compile it. So the, the first time you run a function in Julia, Julia engine will uh, will uh, compile this function. And then the first run is going to be slower because it includes the compilation time. But then the next time you run it, it's actually going to be fast, right? So here we do just a dry run, quick of 10, and then we say print total and then pass a billion uh, to, this, uh, to this function. So integer 64, uh, billion, um, well, an integer number. And then we got a surprising result uh, that the serial runtime is actually zero. And if you count the digits, you see it's zero microseconds. Uh, the result is going to be correct, so it will show exactly the same result as we would with uh, the direct summation, but it's zero microseconds, which sounds suspicious. So now let's change the number to instead of taking taking billion, I just pass you know ten to the fifteen, so that's a thousand trillion, much bigger number. And you run it, and it still it produces invalid result, but the invalid result is due to the fact that integer sixty four has a limited precision, but it still produces a result, and uh, it still shows zero microseconds. So what is going on here? Obviously, you cannot do 10 to the 15 uh, terms in zero microseconds. So it turns out that Julia is actually quite smart. It does optimize things, things under the hood. So it sees that, okay, I'm adding all these integer numbers. And uh, why, why do this, you know, thousands, thousand trillion times when I can just use a formula? So it actually replaces under the, the hood the summation with a direct formula, which is which is which is uh, you know really really good. So, but it's bad for our bench uh, it's bad for our benchmarking because uh, what we really want to do is want to do you know run simple codes uh, like this, but we want want to optimize them. So uh, you know do lots of the usual compile optimization things, but we certainly don't want to replace summation with with uh, the exact formula. So we need to do uh, we need to force computation. And uh, the way we'll do this, uh, we'll actually do something a little bit more complex uh, than a simple integer summation. So I'll show you what we're doing in the next slide. Uh, then we want to exclude the compilation time. So we package our computation into a function and then we do a dry run. So we, we pre-compile it and start doing timing only uh, from the second run. Uh, we, use, um, we make use of optimizations for you know, type stability and other factors, all the usual things compilers do. And so all of this is done by simply, uh, again, placing our computation into a function. Uh, we were going to be timing only the CPU intensive loop. So in uh, examples later on, you will see we'll also be doing a, a lot of IO and I don't time uh, time IO. IO not just to the terminal, but also to the disk. And we don't time those parts. And then for shorter runs, this is just something that uh, I want to uh, mention here, but we don't use it here because all our runs are longer. So for shorter uh, uh, run times, you probably want to use uh, benchmark tools. And uh, uh, B time will actually run your function multiple times and then compute the average, do statistics, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't, you don't want to use B time for macro for a longer run because, uh, well, it just 
a longer run, we're going to actually train fairly accurately, fairly accurately with time. So uh, anyway, this is the function we're going to be, uh, the sum we're going to be uh, uh, running. So the traditional harmonic series actually diverges. So uh, this is a well-known fact from, you know, math 101. Uh, but it turns out that if you take this exactly the same harmonic series and exclude the denominators um, in decimal, uh, whose, uh, whose um, decimal notation uh, contains any fixed digit or any fixed string of digits, then it actually converges, although very slowly. So for example, if we take this harmonic series uh, and compute you know, one to uh, infinity, and uh, then exclude all uh, terms where in the denominator you have a digit zero in decimal notation, then it actually converges to this number. So if you have exclude, let's say exclude all even digits, you get another, another summation. So you exclude more terms and the summation is gonna be uh, smaller. If you exclude, exclude a certain string, for example, there is no string three, one, four, uh, then you'll converge to another number and so on. So really interesting mathematical results. And, but this convergence is, uh, is very slow. So here's an example of uh, the error, logarithm of error versus uh, logarithm of number of terms. And so if you expect the same uh, log, well, linear dependence in the log log space, and I think it is valid for uh, pretty much uh, up, up to infinity to the infinite number of uh, terms. Uh, so it turns out that in order to compute uh, the sum with uh, no nines in the denominator, you actually have to, uh, so to compute it to two significant digits after the decimal point, you actually have to include 10 to the 73 terms. And if you want to compute it to eight uh, significant digits after the decimal point, you actually need to compute, uh, you know, more than uh, 10 to the uh, 200 uh, uh, terms, which is a huge number. So, uh, but I'm using this, I, I really like this, uh, this um, uh, mathematical problem because uh, we know uh, it's a fact that uh, this sum converges. So it does not diverge, it converges. And uh, the more terms we take, the closer we'll get to this exact answer, right? All right. So uh, since we only want to include terms, oh, sorry, excuse me, uh, since we, oops. Uh, give me a second. Yeah, my, my PDF viewer here, unfortunately, it doesn't uh, let me use errors on the page up and page but, uh, down buttons. So, um, because we're only including the terms that uh, do not contain the digit zero, we actually need to uh, check that our denominator does not have uh, that digit. And uh, the easiest way to do this in Julia will be just to look for a substring in a string. So you take uh, our i, the number that was summing, convert it to a string, and then there's a built-in function occurs in. So if the substring nine occurs in the string, then, um, then do not add the term. So if it doesn't occur, then add the term to summation. But it turns out that you can actually do this calculation much faster, so about four times faster using uh, uh, integer operations. So well, these uh, mathematical operations on integers. So we here we initialize a function called digits in, and to this we pass a number and then a series of digits that will be interpreted as a string. So for example, if we want to exclude nine, we just pass nine. If we want to exclude three one four, we pass uh, three hundred fourteen, and so on. So this runs about four times faster than uh, than um, uh, than the uh, substring uh, search. And so thanks for uh, to Paul Schrimpf from uh, the Vancouver School of Economics for for this function he pointed out that this is much faster than searching for a substring. All right, so let's switch to 10 to the nine terms and uh, let's start doing our summation. So here we have um, the function uh, slow that takes in uh, the upper limit. So it's gonna be a billion and then the digit. So uh, I'm passing a billion and then a digit. And then it simply says that if a digit is not in, uh, in this number, then, uh, then add the term to the summation. So otherwise don't add it and then print the total. So we do a, a dry run and then we do a total run. So you see the total answer is, uh, is smaller than 22 than our exact summation, but that's exactly uh, what, what we want. Uh, so if we do timing, so this is entirely serial calculation. So I uh, use the add time macro for the, uh, for, the, um, uh, for the loop. And then I do timing, you see that I get 21, 22 seconds. So I did three runs and, and I get uh, about the same consistent number. All right. So let's try to do, do this using an atomic variable. So it's essentially the same code, except that uh, before I was using the uh, regular total, regular global variable, and now I use an atomic variable. So I initialize the atomic variable as a flow 64, uh, zero, and then all threads. So here I have threads, 
Uh, this is a parallel loop using multiple threads. Uh, and I'll be uh, running four threads. Um, uh, sorry, I'll be running this on four threads. Uh, I simply call the function, uh, I, I simply call digits in, uh, and then I, so if, uh, if digits is not an I, then I add that to the total sum. And when I run this on a single thread, then I get the numbers that are slightly worse than the previous uh, serial uh, example. And now if you run it on four threads, you'll see that I get, I get these run times, which are better than the serial run, but they're certainly not a four times speed up, right? Not, not a fourfold speed up. So what is going on? Well, as I mentioned, uh, the atomic variables are not really, uh, are not really um, meant for, uh, they were not designed for this type of calculation where you do this, you know, billions of times and each thread is writing and writing millions and millions of times to, to the same atomic variable. They're really meant for synchronization. Uh, so what we, uh, why the uh, parallel code on four threads is not fast is because uh, most of the time the threads are waiting for other threads. Well, actually one of the threads that is currently writing to the atomic variable to finish that writing, right? So this code by design is slow. All right, are there any questions? I see there was, uh, there is, I didn't pay attention to the chat window, uh, but okay, all right. There no, 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 it's, uh, it's all good, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. So now um, let's try an alternative threat safe implementation. So here I, um, I initialize an array uh, of zeros, flow 64, where if I run this on four threads, uh, this will, array will have four elements, right? So each thread is gonna be writing into its own uh, array element. So total has four elements and then we have four threads. Each thread is writing into its own array element. And so here we are using the same function, they just in, and then uh, we're writing to an element for, from a given thread, uh, element thread ID, right? So this is perfect, uh, perfect, you know, perfect synchronization. Threads don't talk to each other; they just fill in those four uh, local sums. And then once you finish the parallel loop, you compute the total sum by simply uh, using the sum function. So you compute the sum of those uh, four four terms, and then you you print it. Right. So if we run this on a single uh, using a single thread, we get slightly worse run times than uh, than the um, than the uh, serial run. So we get instead of 21, 22 seconds, we get 24 seconds, 23 seconds. And then if I run it on four threads, you see that there's actually better speed up than the previous example. So previously I was uh, measuring 17, 18 seconds, and now I get you know 10, 10 seconds uh, more or less consistently. So you'll see uh, you'll see speed up, which is uh, much better than before. It's still not a perfect speed up, but this is uh, this is much better than before, right? All right, so why could this code be slow? So uh, my guess is, I don't know exactly, but my guess is uh, here we're calling a function thread ID and maybe uh, this function is just every time you call it, uh, this function takes a while. I assume there is under the hood, there is some caching. So when you call the same function, you know, multiple time primes from a given thread, there is some caching and uh, that number is uh, reutilized, but I don't know exactly, but as you see, there is not a perfect speed up. So I can guess, but I don't know why there is no, there is no perfect speed up. So now uh, let me go, let me show you the third example. Uh, so this one, uh, just looking at the code, I would uh, think that this is, <clears throat> this should be the fastest implementation. <clears throat> so what I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, what I'm doing here is uh, I uh, break my sum summation into, into four sums. And uh, here I explicitly for each thread, so uh, num threads is equal, let's say four. So I have a parallel loop here. So where a uh, thread ID runs from one to four, right? And then each thread does its own part of the calculation. So I explicitly by hand break my sum into four chunks. And then each thread is gonna be computing only the values of I from start to finish, right? So if you actually run this code, you will see that uh, each thread will print uh, its own range of indices that it is processing. And then each thread is writing into its own element, uh, thread ID, so total of, of thread ID. And then uh, we end up with four elements as in previous example, and then we sum them up. But here I'm not using the function thread ID, you know, inside the loop. So thread ID is just, is just a variable right here, right? So I think uh, it could be faster for, for this exact reason that I'm not uh, calling the function. And it is slightly faster. So I'm not sure whether this reason or not, but when I actually run it on her threads, I see slightly better run times than the previous example. Uh, but all, all these three examples actually, so using the atomic variable, using a writing into uh, 
its own uh, um, array element using thread ID function, and then uh, subdividing the tasks by hand. All of them work, uh, but they produce different runtimes, right? So, uh, but I think it all makes sense, and you will get uh, so the best speed up you you, you get from from the last example, but it's also, it's still not a four, four, uh, four uh, times uh, speed up. So I also um, timed the uh, last code on the CD cluster. So on a CD cluster, I simply wrote a batch script where I'm calling a, uh, so I'm submitting a slam job asking for a single MPI task and then CPUs per task, it's either one, two, four, eight or 16. And then uh, asking for you know, 36 megabyte of memory per, uh, per, per CPU, so per, per each core. Uh, for each thread, then maximum runtime. And then, so here it's important if you're doing this on a computer Canada cluster, you want to load the latest Julia. So actually it's not the latest, but it's a fairly recent version of Julia. We have it installed in the standard uh, 2020 environment. So you load the Julia module, and then you simply inside the job submission script, you're saying Julia minus T, this variable will be equal to the number of, uh, number of cores you are utilizing. So it's going to be simply this value. And then you're passing the function. And so here, here's the timing for, uh, for uh, average over three runs for each example. Uh, on uh, on CETA. And you see that CETA cores are slightly slower, so almost factor of two slower than uh, the cores on my laptop. And uh, here are the timings. So you see fairly good speed up. It's still not a linear speed up, not perfect scaling, but you see consistent monotonic speed up. Uh, the more threads you, you have, the better, the faster your code runs. All right. If there are no questions, uh, I will switch to the next section. So now I will talk about distributed computing. And uh, by the way, we have a lot of material, so I don't expect to cover everything in the next uh, 30 minutes. Uh, I will probably just compress it and we'll try to leave some time for questions, but you will have access to the complete slides and you can start them after the webinar. So distributed unlike threads, uh, distributed in Julia provides multi-processing environment. So that means that you're actually launching not multiple threads, but you're launching multiple processes. And then these processes can, can talk to each other by uh, either by shared memory or by MPI. Actually, uh, they, they talk by MPI message passing interface, but that can happen by shared memory if you're running just on a single node. And uh, Julia implementation of uh, message passing is one-sided. So usually what you do, you launch a function from, uh, you start with a single control process, start computing on a control process, and then you have a number of worker processes running on other processes for other CPU cores. And then from the control process, you launch a function uh, and you ask one of the worker processes to run this function, right? So you issue a remote call, uh, which uh, results, uh, so you, you spawn a remote function on a different core. And then this remote function will return a remote future reference to the uh, calling processor. And then the calling processor will continue a separation. So while the remote function is running and the remote processor is busy doing its calculation, the control processor will actually uh, will actually resume doing uh, whatever whatever it was doing, right? So it's not it's not blocking uh, uh, it's not a blocking call. And then if you want to get the result from the remote processor, typically you would uh, call a fetch function, and you fetch uh, the so you pass the remote or future reference to this function, and then it will get you the result from the uh, remote function. So if remote function is busy uh, uh, busy still busy uh, running. I mean, the remote process is still busy running this function, then this will also uh, executing fetch on the control process will block the control process until the function finishes running. So single control process and multiple uh, worker processes. And um, let me show you some examples. So uh, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna restart Julia. And this time I will start it with eight processes, right? So what it does, it actually, launches uh, nine, uh, nine processes. So there is a single control process and then there are eight worker processes, right? So in fact, in Julia, there are three fundamentally different ways uh, or mechanisms you can, you can uh, launch multiple processes in distributed. So either you can pass a flag, let's say minus P8 or whatever number you wanna use uh, to the uh, Julia command. So in the first case, you start uh, Julia, uh, Julia uh, repel or you can just run a code, uh, you know, uh, as, as a batch, as a, as a batch code. So you just pass the code, and then it will run this code using a single control process and eight uh, worker processes. You can also do this from a job submission script. So uh, if you're running on a computer kernel cluster, you can submit a job submission script where you ask for a certain number of MPI tasks. So now, now MPI, you have multiple MPI tasks because you're launching multiple processes, a uh, single CPU per task. And then you run, so once this starts running, you run the srun command, uh, 
executing host name uh, function hostname uh, command on each process. And then this will write, so each process will uh, write to the host file, same host file. So this is parallel IO. This is done through SRAN. So basically, instead of host file, at the end, you will have a list of nodes. And then if on a given node, you have, let's say, two processes, then you will see that node repeating twice. And this is called a host file. And then uh, the reason I have sleep five here, so I'm just waiting for all to finish. And then I simply use uh, launch Julia with that dash machine file, passing the name of the host file. So listing the nodes uh, on, on which I, I'm gonna be running. And then I, I pass the code. So this will run as well. Uh, so you can do this, this works on computer kind of classes, but actually I don't have to do this. You can use a, uh, the first mechanism as well. And that's, that will work as well. So you simply say, instead of having these last three commands, you simply say Julia minus P and then uh, you, know, you have an environment, slow environment variable. Uh, seeing how many processes you're, you're running on, and then you pass your code. So also you can do that from inside Julia. So in Julia, you can actually start Julia by uh, simply issuing the Julia command. And then you will say uh, using distributed. So right now I'm running Julia just with a single control process. There are no worker processes. So I uh, load the distributed library, and then I say add processes. So now I add, added, oops, sorry, I added eight processes. So here we have eight workers and uh, the, the workers are ID'd from two to nine. So the idea is that ID one uh, goes to the control process, right? So we have control process plus eight, eight workers. And this eight workers uh, ideally will run each on its own processor core. On my laptop, I have just two cores. So obviously um, multiple processes will be, uh, will be taking turns running on a, on a single core on my two uh, laptop cores, right? Anyway, so uh, you can use uh, all three methods uh, from a Compute Canada, uh, on a Compute Canada cluster. I suggest to use, uh, you know, well, either one or, or three doesn't matter, but you can also use the second method if you want, but all three methods uh, will work from uh, on an HPC cluster. All right, so uh, let's start Julia. Actually, let me restart Julia and uh, as a single uh, processor, uh, processor um, job, well, not job run. Uh, and then I will add four uh, worker processes to it. So, oops, of course I need to say using distributed, I will forget doing this. And then we add four processes to it. And then we can uh, issue this line. So number of cores, and it will give us the total number of cores. And I'll say there are five cores, there is a control process, and then there are four additional processes, but of course I have two physical cores on my laptop. So by course, it refers to processes, total number of processes, and then number of workers, it's four workers, right? So five processes, four workers. And I can actually list them, very convenient command, with the workers function. So later on, you will see examples where I simply use this as an iterator, so I go through all workers, and then I spawn something on each worker. So if you want to uh, remove processes, you can use these commands. For example, remove two processes uh, immediately. You will just use the IDs, remove process two and three, and don't wait for it, so do it immediately. And then if you run workers again, you will see that only workers four and five are present. So here I'm organizing a loop where I shall go through all workers in the output of the workers function. And then I remove a worker number i. So this is a serial loop, right? So what I'm doing here, go to the first worker, remove the worker, and then, uh, so T is a reference. Uh, so what I mentioned before, two slides ago, it's a future, it's a, a future of reference uh, to a uh, remote call. So I wait for T to uh, to be released to um, uh, for, for this um, remove process operation to uh, be successful to finish. And then I go to the next worker, next worker, and so on. So the result is when I run this loop, there will be no workers left, right? But of course I can add workers later on. So I can say add processes and let's say add four additional workers and I'll just add new workers. And also uh, there's an interrupt function that will simply uh, do the same as running this loop. It will simply remove all workers from, uh, from your pool, right? So let's start uh, some, some computing. Let's start with four uh, remote workers. So here I have four remote workers and let's just run a function. Here I define a function show my ID, uh, which is this, right? So what this function does, it doesn't take any arguments. It will simply print the ID of the current process. And uh, I define this function everywhere. So this is very important. Everywhere, I just make sure that the same definition will be available on the control process on all workers. And then I run it. So here I define the function. And then I'll say uh, show ID. And this will run the function on the control process, right? So it says my ID is one, right? So if on that hand, I preface it with everywhere and everywhere, then we'll actually run it everywhere. So it will run on the control process and then on, on each of the workers. 
So now uh, let's uh, say we define a function, uh, sorry, a function, a variable on the control process. And then we try to run this uh, print line everywhere, right? So print line, if we just see uh, print uh, line and print this variable, of course, it will print the variable on the control process. So let's try doing the same on all processes. And you will see that you get an error message. And the reason for this is the variable X was defined on the control process. So it's not available on the remote processes, right? And this is by design. So every function does not pass the variables, uh, well, everywhere macro uh, doesn't pass the uh, variables to the remote processes. So one way to work around this will be to use the uh, this notation. So uh, dollar sign X will actually pass the value of X to a remote process, right? And it works. All right. So let's initialize an, an, another uh, variable. Uh, let's say a equal to 12 on the control process. And then we want to print this variable on, let's say, processor two. So I'm going to use the function spawn add. Uh, so a macro. Macro add spawn add uh, spawn uh, this line, this computation. So print the, uh, print the value of a at processor, uh, sorry, not processor, worker number two. So that's this the first, uh, uh, first uh, worker process. And uh, it does something. So you see, it actually prints a future reference. So what it is, it's actually uh, that handle. So a future a future reference uh, to the remotely running function. And I can actually take this reference. I'm going to show you an example very soon. Pass it to another variable, and then you, uh, pass that variable into fetch, and that will get you the result of the remote function. So in this case, we actually, we're not interested in the result itself. So this remote, uh, there's no remote function. I mean, it's, it's a print line function, right? But it just prints into the terminal. So that's the reason why we already see the answer. So from worker two, uh, uh, the value of A is equal to 12. Uh, it, we see the result in our terminal. And so in this case, we don't actually return something from a function. We're not interested in the, uh, in the return statement from print line. It just prints into the line and it works. So what Spawn does here, it passes the uh, namespace of local variables to worker number two. So uh, the variable A is gonna be available on uh, worker number two. Then you spawn a function execution. So in this case, print function on, the, uh, on worker number two. You return a future handle uh, to the control process. And then you return control to the, uh, to the, uh, to the um, uh, control of the uh, uh, repel of the shell to the control process, right? So the control process doesn't pause while this function is running on the remote processor. All right, so here's another example. Uh, let's say we have E equal to, uh, equal to 12 uh, defined on the control process. And then we uh, spawn this calculation, uh, compute E plus 10 on process number two. And uh, this will work, but it doesn't return the results. It returns a future reference. So how do you get the result? The result actually will not. So the result is, was computed on process number, worker number two, but it's not available to us. We don't see it in the terminal, right? So the control process doesn't know anything about it. So this is where you have to use the future reference. One of the ways to do this is you simply pass the output of this spawn add macro to a variable, a local variable, let's say call it R. Uh, then you can actually, uh, if you type, uh, if you um, uh, print its type, you will see that it's not a regular variable, it's a future uh, variable, so a future reference to remote execution. And then you simply, to get the result, you simply type a fetch of R and you get the answer. So it is, uh, yeah, it is uh, 22, so 12 plus 10. So now um, uh, you can actually take these two lines, so spawn add macro and the fetch function and put them into a single line. So you can say fetch off and then spawn add two a plus 10 is gonna be the argument. So you compute, you take uh, the calculation, send it to remote processor, and then in a single line, you, you fetch the result back. And also alternative sense index is fetch from, and so this also includes spawn, right? So if you just type this, this will do exactly the same thing. So it will spawn the A plus 10 calculation, the remote process, and then it will fetch uh, the answer, all right? Now, let's go back to the slow series. So here we have uh, the function, uh, this the entire code. And uh, uh, what I'm doing here is I have the digits function, right? Which computes the, uh, which basically is, it returns uh, either true or false, depending on whether my series of digits is in a given number. And then I have a function uh, that computes the slow function. So here I don't have any parallelization, right? I just do the serial function. And then uh, I uh, compute it here. So here I do a dry run and then I compute it passing 
a billion terms to it. So uh, compute uh, the sum from one to, uh, to a billion, uh, the harmonic series, uh, and exclude all denominators with the number nine. And then uh, I time these, I time this three times, and you see that uh, I get 25 seconds, 24 seconds, 26 seconds. Now, I run the same function using everywhere, right? And uh, what happens here is that you're actually doing exactly the same computation, right? So you're running a serial code three times, but you're running the identical serial code three times. So uh, three times, if, well, assuming they have two worker processes, right? So in, in the shell, in this example, I had four worker processes. So assume that I have two worker processes and one control process. When you do something like this, uh, when you do add everywhere, it runs uh, a single, uh, the function on the control process, and then it runs exactly the same function on each of the two workers. And these are the numbers I get. So I get three numbers back. And then if I time this, the same calculation uh, just using my stopwatch, I see roughly three, 33, uh, 33 seconds. So it's interesting that these three calculations are running simultaneously and they take longer than a serial run, obviously. So I have two physical cores and then I have three calculations. So it, what is interesting here is that it actually doesn't take twice as long, right? So you would assume that you have two physical cores and you have three, fun three instances uh, of a function running on two physical cores you would actually, it would actually take, you know, twice as long because, uh, well, because you can't fit, you know, uh, three functions into, into, into a single batch at the same time. But it turns out that it doesn't take twice as long and I'm not sure exactly what is happening here. So I tried searching online, but I don't know whether this is the effect of hyperthreading. So using four logical cores and two physical cores, or this is just Julia being smart and uh, launching these, uh, passing the, uh, one of the functions around uh, to an idle processor. So I'm not sure exactly. Uh, but it works, uh, but the problem here is it's a serial code. It's still a serial code, right? So if for fun, if I just try to oops, uh, run the same using um, four workers on two physical cores, anybody can guess what will happen? So I have two physical cores and I add two processes for the uh, total of four workers and I, use, I run everywhere, what will happen? So actually what happens here is it will take twice as long. So it will take roughly a minute to compute uh, to compute this uh, to do this computation. Anyway, so let's try to parallelize our uh, slow series. Uh, so to parallelize it, uh, what I'm doing is I um, let's see. Yes. So what I'm doing here is I um. I include two uh, additional arguments to the function. So task ID and number of tasks. And what these do is uh, those will simply uh, modify my summation. So now on each thread, I'm doing summation from uh, not from one to N uh, with a step of one, with a stride of one, but from task ID to N with a stride of N tasks, right? So this will ensure that each thread, uh, not each thread, each process, now we're talking about processes, each process does not the total sum, but only a partial sum, right? So each process computes a partial sum with a stride of n tasks, and then we are summing uh, summing up the uh, the total. So uh, uh, here's uh, so I define my uh, function slow, and then I send this function slow to a worker number one, and then I send it to a worker number two. Actually, uh, this time what I'm doing is instead of uh, specifying explicitly which worker I'm sending it, I'm uh, using the uh, column any keyword, and this will just pick uh, any any worker, any available or idle worker. And I do it twice, so I have two physical cores, and I do it once, it sends it to first core, and then uh, I do it twice, it sends it to second core, right? And by having, you know, having one and two here, I ensure that I compute partial sums, and they are not the same, but their sum will actually uh, give me the total, uh, the right total answer, right? So here A and B are the two future references. And then to actually get the result, I need to fetch them. So I say total is equal to the sum of fetch of A and fetch of B, and I get the right answer, right? And if I, uh, since I'm, I have time here, I can actually time the two function executions, and I see that each function uh, uh, took uh, well 11 or, or 12 seconds. So this is roughly a, and this, and they're running at the same time. So if I time using my stopwatch, I get roughly 12 or maybe 13 seconds here. So I get pretty much um, a twofold uh, speed up, exactly as it should be. So the problem with this code is that uh, it's manual. So here, if I want to launch, let's say, 10, uh, 10 um, functions on, on 10 remote workers, then I would have to do uh, this, you know, 
at 10 lines. And obviously I don't want to do this because uh, there, are, there are better ways of doing this. So what I can do is instead of using you know, a single variable, a single uh, variable for a, uh, for a future reference, you can actually use an array of future references. So here's what, uh, what uh, you, you can do. So in this case, I'm using array comprehension. I'm com uh, com uh, building an array uh, called R. So it's an array of future references where I have this function slow. So I'm running a, um, I'm a uh, yeah, here I'm sending a function slow to a worker number P and a worker number P just comes from my workers function. So workers function returns a collection of the workers. So P is one of the elements inside of workers. So I'm sending this function to worker number P. I'm doing this inside a loop. And then uh, the thread ID is actually an integer from one to, uh, to how many workers I have. So this is an integer starting from one. And then this is total number of workers, right? So these compute partial sums. So I have, let's say if I run it on 10 processes, I have 10 partial sums. And then all I need to do is just fetch those individual uh, array elements and then compute the sum, the total. And it computes the total sum. And in my case, when I run this, it doesn't give me any speed up compared to the previous slide because I still have two physical, uh, physical cores. But if I were to do this on a, um, on a machine with many more cores, then it will give a, a much better speed up, all right? So now uh, there's actually a better and easy implementation of, of, of this function. So instead of uh, using the uh, multiple uh, remote, um, remote elements, or multiple uh, uh, future reference elements, what you can do is uh, you can simply uh, use a parallel for loop. So in this case, I have a parallel for loop distributed plus where I go uh, through all the elements from one to a billion. And then uh, what this loop does, so it's a parallel for loop right here. And what it does is it breaks, uh, depending on how many processes I will have, uh, it will break my sum into partial sums. Each sum will go to its own processor then each sum computes its own partial sum. And then all these sums will be uh, added together using the uh, summation operation, right? So this is reduction. It's a distributed operation with reduction and reduction is the summation operation. So, and this index is simply saying that uh, inside this function, uh, what I need to, <clears throat> I need to have a statement. The last statement in this function, not a print statement, but actual uh, numerical statement is gonna be a number that is gonna be added to the sum to the partial sum. So depending on whether my uh, digits, my collection of digits appears in I or not, I will add uh, one or uh, sorry, one divided by I, or I will add zero, right? And then, so this, uh, this is actually a parallel loop. And then when you run it, uh, you will see there is a speed up. So I run on two physical cores, I get the same number. Uh, so uh, 14 point something, and then I get roughly a, uh, well, 2 point, you know, 2.4, 2.3, uh, uh, fold uh, speed up, which is great. All right, so here, how I would run this function, uh, the, the code from the previous slide on CEDA. So in this case, I am launching a, uh, so I wanna launch multiple processes, right? Uh, so I'm gonna be using uh, a dash dash and tasks to uh, to show, uh, to, to schedule multiple processes. So number of MPI tasks, CPUs per task is gonna be one. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, important if I want to control how many how many nodes I want to use. So whether I want all these tasks to run on the same node or across different nodes. And you will see in a second why this is important. And then I basically load the Julia environment. And then here I print the list of nodes on which uh, my code is running. And then I'll launch my code. So Julia minus P, launch multiple processes. How many processes? Well, this returned by slow number of tasks, number of MPI tasks inside my job. And then I launched the code from the previous example. So now let's go to timing. If I run uh, this code as serial, so now instead of 24 seconds and so, it's 48 seconds. So uh, a single core on CEDA is roughly two times slower than my uh, single core on my laptop. Running on two cores, I uh, give you uh, uh, not two fold uh, speed up, but it gives you some speed up. So my guess is probably at the time when I was running this, uh, and again, this average over three runs, uh, that core was either busy or the network was busy, or you know it could be any number of reasons, but uh, it gave me a little bit uh, of speed up. Then I run on four cores. I get almost four full speed up. So you see here is perfect scaling. And then I keep decreasing. I keep increasing the number of cores and then I get better and better runtime. So if I use all cores on the same node, I, my runtime goes from 48 seconds to two seconds. So I get, you know, I get really, really good speed up. So not factor of 20, not factor of 32, but still fairly, fairly uh, good, uh, good number. So a factor of 24, I guess. 
but then if I uh, modify my submission script and I ask this code and run this code on multiple nodes, my runtime gets much worse, right? So now I go from 32 cores. Now I go from two seconds to 11 seconds. And the reason for this is because now, instead of using shared memory to exchange messages, these different processes will use the network and the network you know, is slower than shared memory. And uh, it, other people can be running codes, you know, saturating the, the bandwidth of the network at the same time. And uh, this is why it is much slower when spread across multiple, uh, multiple processes, or multiple nodes, sorry. Any questions at this point? So the third solution would be uh, to use PMAP to R map arguments to processes. So here we have uh, the code where I have the slow function. And uh, the slow function, I'm also computing the partial sum. So the partial sum goes on each, on each process, it goes from task ID to N with a stride equal to number of tasks, right? So each, each process is computing a partial sum. <clears throat> so this time I, I also pass four uh, numbers as arguments, but I do this inside a tuple. So uh, actually I pass a single argument, which is a tuple and it's a collection of four, four numbers, right? And the reason I do a tuple is a tuple is because I will be using PMAP uh, to map arguments to processes. So here I run it a single time, so a dry run, and then uh, N N W is the number of workers, right? And then I uh, use the array comprehension to build an array of tuples. So there are as many tuples as the number of workers, remote workers, and then each tuple will contain four numbers. So the uh, the uh, limit of summation. Uh, the, um, the the digit that I want to exclu exclude the um, uh, the uh, task ID and then the total number of workers, right? So if you were to run this, we'll actually see that this uh, builds an array of of tuples. And then uh, what I'm doing is I'm simply calling uh, calling pmap, passing to pmap the function that I'm going to be sending to each worker, and then the argument. So what pmap does, it takes this function and it runs this function on each of the remote workers using the uh, respective element from the arguments array, right? So on each, on each remote worker, it will use different values for the, uh, for the summation, um, well, um, uh, for, the, uh, for the partial sums. And then I compute the total and then uh, the total is gonna be printed. So the total sum and then, and then I print it. So there's also, and this works really well. Uh, so there's also alternative syntax for, uh, for PMAP. I can actually specify the function right here. Uh, with uh, using this syntax and then uh, pass the arguments. So the same array of, of tuples. And I didn't include the summation, oh, sorry, I didn't include the timing, but the timing is as good as, as the previous timing. So with the previous example. Now, optional integration with Slum. So here, all I wanted to say is that um, uh, yeah, there, there's a cluster managers package in Julia. And what it does is, uh, let me just click on this link. It simply lets you include the, um, uh, the SALAC or as batch parts of uh, launching a job right inside your Julia script. So this integrates with many, uh, many uh, different schedules. We use Slurm on compute kernel clusters. And what it does basically you build a single, there's no job submission script. You build a single uh, um, Julia code. And from inside this Julia code, you launch your, uh, you launch your uh, slum job and from that slum job, you launch your actual uh, calculation. Uh, so this is convenient, uh, but well, actually in my case, it's, it's not really convenient, but it's certainly not a necessity. So that's why I don't wanna spend any time in classes managers. You don't have to use classes managers, uh, contrary to what the multiple Julia forums will, will let you know. So actually we discourage you from using cluster managers because it, will, it can uh, cause problems. It will, it, you, it, it should work, but it might cause problems in some cases. And so what we really want you to do is just write a just regular Slurm job submission script. And then from the job submission script, uh, you uh, launch your, launch your uh, well, call your Julia uh, code. All right, so we have almost no time left, unfortunately, and there are some cool examples. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I think we'll probably want to schedule a second webinar. And then in the second webinar, we'll go through these examples. Uh, but you have this access to the slides now. So if you're interested, you can just study them on your own. So here I'm talking about distributed arrays and shared arrays. So distributed arrays is a method in Julia to split an array physically across multiple processes, with, so whether on the same node or on multiple nodes. And this is uh, important if you have a very large array that doesn't feed on, into memory or let's say on a single node, and then you can actually spread it across process on multiple nodes, right? And then you can do also parallel calculation whether on the same node or different nodes, you can do parallel calculations on, on these distributed processor. 
And so here we have a, a, a code to compute Julia set, uh, which is uh, which uh, produces something like this. And then I show you actually uh, the parallelization of this code. And then uh, I uh, do some really nice demos, but unfortunately I don't have any time because we only have three minutes before the hour and I don't really wanna spill this into the next hour. Uh, so this is one of the things I, I do here and it works beautifully, so it parallelizes very well. And the second thing is shared arrays. So shared arrays is um, it's part of the uh, Julia standard library. So it comes with uh, the language when you install it. And what it does, it actually, uh, um, it, uh, you, you can define a shared array object on the control process. And then all other processes will have access to it, not just read access like with the distributed array, but also write access. And in practice, what happens, the entire array is stored on the control process, but there is a significant cache on each worker as well, because each worker wants to work with that, uh, with that uh, uh, shared array stored on the control process. And so the second example I have is the end body problem. And so what the end body problem does is, so here I have the entire end body code. And what it does is um, it's actually, it took us some time to write this code because it's writing in body codes is not easy. Uh, so there are, there are lots of examples. The problem with uh, simple examples is they produce uh, results that are not accurate. Uh, so when you do, when you write an body code is you really wanna uh, use adaptive time steps to make sure that uh, your, uh, your, um, your uh, solution is stable. Uh, so if you want to check whether a solution is stable or not, simply run it with you know, a time step that is twice as short and then see whether the result diverges or not. But basically, you know, uh, there are all these things, uh, ideas that go into this code. And uh, I just want to show you the solution. So if you run this code with two particles, oh, let's launch this on different screen, uh, with two particles. Uh, so the idea is that you take a unit cube and then you throw n, particle, n identical particles in, randomly into this cube and then you turn on gravity. So zero initial velocity, uh, velocities and then you turn on gravity and then particles will, will start well, attracting to each other. And then what happens with two particles because they're infinitely small, they will just fly through each other and then they will keep oscillating infinitely, right? So that's what happens with two particles. And in your n-body code, if you don't get infinite oscillations with the same amplitude, that means that you're not computing it accurately. So this is actually a very tough problem to, you know, tough solution to reproduce. So if you do it with 20 bodies, uh, you uh, will have something like this. So here's a solution with 20 bodies and um, uh, it's the solution is stable. So I check this and, um, and uh, uh, I'm doing, I'm using, so for each particle, I'm computing the force as a sum over all other particles. So it's an N squared calculation as opposed to a tree algorithm, right? So an N squared calculation obviously doesn't scale very well. So it scales as N squared and each N is very large, then, uh, then it becomes uh, very slow. So this code does, uh, oops, sorry, uh, where's my code? So this code does the entire calculation and then it stores the result as a series of PNG images that you can merge into a movie. And then I use shared arrays to parallelize this code. So why I use shared arrays? Well, the reason is because there is no large data structure, unlike in the previous example. Uh, there, is, there are lots of small, uh, there are a few small arrays, but because they're small, I can actually afford to have a large fraction of each array on each individual processor, so multiple copies of the same uh, array. And uh, this works very well on uh, both on, uh, on a laptop and on the cluster. It does not use a lot of memory. Uh, and then uh, the advantage of shared arrays versus versus distributed arrays is they are simpler to use, they're simpler to write to from, from uh, individual uh, processes, from uh, worker processes. And then uh, I have a parallel code that can actually uh, work faster. So here's uh, benchmarking for that code on my laptop and on the CEDA cluster. And I get, I get reasonable scale on, on the CEDA cluster. Not perfect scaling, but reasonable scaling. And as you notice, as I increase the number of processes, it actually stalls. And in fact, it doesn't compute any faster than 32 cores as opposed to 16 cores. And uh, the reason, there are multiple reasons for this, but the reason is because your N is very small. So you're doing quite a lot of communication as opposed to computation and uh, your code just stalls, parallel scaling stalls. But if you wanna get better parallel scaling with this code, basically increase the number of particles. So I will stop here. Uh, lots of things that I didn't cover, but I feel like we should probably have a second webinar to cover the, you know, the second part of the slice in detail. And so we talked about multi-threading, multi-processing detail. Did not have time to cover distributed arrays and shared arrays. 
And uh, yeah, a couple of useful uh, resource links that I, uh, that I um, used while preparing for this webinar. So actually my colleague uh, Baolai, uh, Baolai uh, gave from Sharknet. A uh, few months ago, he gave a webinar on Parallel Julia that has a lot of, uh, he covered a very similar uh, material, uh, different examples. And uh, if you find that my webinar is uh, not, uh, well, was not very useful, then you can watch a wireless webinar and, uh, and uh, see another take on, on the same concepts. And uh, another useful resource is Julia at Scale Forum, which contains uh, you know, lots of conversations on how to run Julia on HPC clusters and for big problems and, and so on. So on this note, I will stop. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or ask them in the chat. And thanks, uh, Ben, for the couple of uh, useful comments that you posted in the chat. It was uh, nice to share because, uh, yeah, Alex and I are, uh, are learning Julia, so. Uh... Yeah, so um, I started uh, looking into Parallel Julia just a few weeks ago, so all this stuff is new to me. And uh, I have quite expensive background in, uh, in Parallel calculation, so I've been teaching Perl, uh, Perl MPI for, you know, 10 or 15 years. And uh, I, um, so in, in the past few years, we've been teaching uh, parallel programming using uh, Chapel language. So Chapel is another example of parallel language. And uh, it's very interesting to compare uh, Julia uh, parallelization with, um, with Chapel parallelization, very different approaches. And so in Chapel, it's more, uh, it's easy to use and it's more powerful in Chapel than I would say in Julia, but Julia is, is probably catching up, although it can do exactly what, what Chapel can do. I mean, as as well, but it's it's catching up. I would say. So. Any questions? Um, yep. Yeah? I have one question. So first of all, thank you very much for this. Um, sure. So, do you recommend more uh, the worker approach? Uh, with multiple workers or using threads? That's my first question. Oh, it depends. Yeah, so let me answer this. It depends on what you're doing. So if you're doing, and it depends on, on your problem, right? So if your problem takes, let's say, it takes a year to compute in serial, a very large problem, uh, then you probably want to use multiple processes because with processes, you can scale beyond single node, right? Because it's a very large problem. And you know, if you throw, let's say, 32 or 24 cores, on this problem, stake, it will still take you know a month or half a month to compute, right? So a very large problem. So with uh, threads, you're always limited in scaling to a single node, right? By definition, because all threads talk to the same. Uh, I mean, it's multiple cores on the same physical machine that talk to shared memory, right? Whereas processes can be anywhere; they can be on the same node or on multiple nodes. So with processes, you basically will have much better, much better scaling for bigger problems. But the answer depends on really what you do. If you want to parallelize a code that you know takes a few hours to run, then threads is perfectly fine. So because you know, instead of a few hours, it will take you know 10 minutes or half an hour, but you're still not really limited. But for much bigger problems, you probably want to use processes. The one one thing I practically have been frustrated with is working with data frames, large data frames, and yeah. sorting them. Uh, the, it seems that Julia is still using a single threaded sort algorithm. Okay. Uh, so do you have any heard anything about this going forward I, or any alternatives or, or any way I to have do this not better? so I don't know uh, the answer because I have not looked into data frames for Julie at all so I just don't know unfortunately um, I'm not sure whether this will be very relevant or not but there is also Julia DB for very large database and it's based on dagger and I I'm not sure whether that would be relevant for you but that might be something to possibly look into. I don't know. It, it's built on Dagger, which is a, a Julia equivalent of Dask. I've heard about it. I've not looked into it yet, but thank you. Yeah, it looks yeah, good. We'll probably, we'll probably do a webinar on Dagger in the fall or yeah. next year. So yeah, we'll look into it as well. So uh, Alex, uh, thank you very much. Uh, one quick question. So do you compare uh, this parallelization with MPI in C or C++ or other compiled mm -hmm. languages? What, what is your impression? Oh, it's, uh, you should get very similar speed up. So it's the same, it's the same idea. So underneath, if you're using distributed, you're running uh, using multiple processes, right? So <clears throat> effectively, it's the same as MPI. So uh, it is easier. So what I showed you today, distributed, is easier than MPI because all you're doing is just uh, you're launching a remote function. So you don't, sending, you don't send uh, variables explicitly. So in terms of performance, it should be very similar to MPI. In terms of ease of use, it's much easier than MPI, mm -hmm. right? So does this answer your question? 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, underneath it uses MPI, so it should be still as fast pretty much. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, question compared yeah. to chapel. Uh, yeah. So compared to chapel, um, so chapel by itself, I have not, for this webinar, I have not really compared benchmarked uh, Julia and Chapel for on using many examples. So I think we just did it for one of the examples and we found Ch Chapel much, much, much better. So the thing with Chapel, so <clears throat> Chapel itself is uh, because Chapel uh, compiler converts to C code and then it converts C code to uh, to a machine binary and has tons of optimizations underneath. So Chapel itself is a little bit slower than a compiled C code. So I don't know how, you know, if you just take the numerical part in Julia and numerical part in Chapel, how they compare to each other, I don't know exactly. I suspect Julia will be a little bit faster, uh, but I don't know exactly. However, what we found is that uh, Chapel, <clears throat> so for example, with threads, uh, we were uh, comparing performance of um, uh, threaded reduction and we found that Chapel is actually faster. So one of the reasons is because Julia thread, Julia's threads uh, do not have built-in um, built reduction, right? Uh, and Chapel threads do have built-in reduction. And uh, we found that Chapel shows just perfect scaling. I mean, whatever you do, it just shows perfect scaling, scaling using multiple threads, whereas Julia does, does not always, so. Yeah, but um, uh, we also tried some packages that do offer uh, reduction capability, like a F loop or F loops. And it wasn't scaling well in the little test we did. So, um, but not as well as at Chapel in any event. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, if not, then thanks everybody. And we'll be scheduling uh, Julia webinars in the future. As I mentioned, I, well, I didn't cover really shared arrays and distributed arrays today. So we'll probably do that in a future webinar. We'll do a webinar on, on Dagger for working with, um, with uh, for, for distributing uh, functions uh, similar to Dask. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, lots of very exciting topics and uh, look for our future webinars. And then the recording of the, this webinar is gonna be available on the same, uh, same website as the slides. So the uh, link uh, that you already have for the slides, uh, we'll post the recording in, in a couple of days. So, uh, oh, and, and another, I'm sorry, uh, another yeah. another way to possibly uh, optimize code is also to run Julia on GPU, and there are a number of packages uh, on um, Julia on GPU, and we'll uh, we'll also uh, do stuff uh, along those lines in the future.